but the next decade there was still no sitting with folded hands. An entry in the journal of the Ladies Guild Records read, Mrs. Long and Mrs. Julia Miller had called out all the ladies of the church and asked them to meet and start a guild for the purpose of making some repairs to the church. All being willing, Friday, December 1st, 1900, Miss Gattrell's was the appointed time and place. But Tuesday before, Bishop Atwill wrote to the church people saying he wished to meet there that day. Instead of organizing a guild, the bishop counseled with the people as to the advisability of changing the rector. While all were sorry to have Reverend J.W. Dunn removed after having been in charge of St. Paul's mission for 21 years, it was deemed necessary for the welfare of the church. The bishop decided the associate mission should take St. Paul's mission in charge. So, Father Dunn left St. Paul's, and the parish's life became much quieter. The growth of St. Paul's would from that time on be struggling, but fulfilling up to the present days of the 1980s. A list of priests serving St. Paul's from 1901 until 1947 reveals many gaps. In 1900, it was the bishop himself, John Atwell, who served the church. Then in 1905, R.R. R. Diggs would come down from independence. 1906, the Reverend W.H. Hapt would come from independence. In 1907 and 1908, the Reverend T.W. Barker was resident in Lee Summit, and it was at that time that the sanctuary was added to the church building. 1910, the Deacon Oscar H. Homburger. 1911, the Reverend Arthur Griffin. In 1914, Archdeacon Edward C. Johnson. 1916, the Reverend Carl Reed Taylor. And then, it wasn't until 1927, according to the church records, that the Reverend D. E. Strawn began coming from Warrensburg. Again, another gap, 1932, the Reverend D.F. Reprene came from Independence. And another gap, it wasn't until 1935 that the Reverend William A. Dwise came down from Independence. In 1940, and through the war years until 1947, the Reverend Harold Whitehead served the church as the vicar. There were years, apparently, that no priest served the church, or at least none was recorded. Yet the parish continued to live, sustained not so much by clergy as by the people who loved it. The post-war years brought a dramatic change to Lee Summit, much as the railroad had 70 years before. The small rural village became a city on the edge of the suburbs of a still larger city. It was no longer rural, but it was hardly urban. Hey. Mrs. Sam Marone and Dr. William Bell share with us glimpses of St. Paul's past. Mrs. Marone, I'm really pleased that you could come this afternoon and spend a little time uh, with us. Uh, tell us some things about the, the early days or the days of the church back uh, sometime before I came here. Um, it's one of those areas that uh, we, we don't have a whole lot of documents about in the church records, and that's why I have to rely on people who actually lived here in, in, in Lee Summit and went to St. Paul's. And so I really do appreciate you taking some time to be with us. Uh, what I'm most interested in is just getting a feel for what church life was like and what was going on in St. Paul's when, uh, when you were uh, younger, when uh, you were in high school and when you were growing up. And I know that, uh, Mrs. Marone, you were telling me that uh, when you were in high school, you would come up here to, to Lee Summit and that uh, at that time, um, uh, you, now was the church open then? Did you? No. Okay, it wasn't, but you still, there were some Episcopalians that you knew. I'd like to know a little bit more. About well, the church was closed at that time, but I, ever since I was a little girl, I remember the church. Mm -hmm. And I know when we were in school uh, at Halloween time, they always had to come in and ring the bell. I never got in the church, but I heard it ring. You were close enough to hear it. Close right? enough to hear it. Right? And this was uh, Yes. And you were in, in high school about when? Uh, well, I graduated in 31. So, so this was in the late 20s. And uh, I know the, the children used to play baseball out in the back. That's the reason the uh, window has so many different types of glass in it now, because it, when it was restored, they couldn't match the colors. 
Uh, I've often wondered about what happened on some of the panels. Yes, there used to be a velvet curtain over it, and then they restored it. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure that I didn't hit one of those baseballs because really? I played in the back of the neighborhood gang. Father McGlynn put several balls uh -huh. through it. I'm sure he did. But so the church was closed at that time when you were when you were in high school. And, uh, Episcopalians they didn't come here on, on Sunday then for their worship. Mm -hmm. They went uh, to other churches. Or? When I was a boy. Uh, I lived across the street. My parents built a house across the street, 415 South Grand, 1927. And I lived from 27 until about 1965 in that house. And uh, so I've seen quite a bit of activity. But uh, no, the church was essentially closed uh, all from 27 until of course, I don't remember 1927 too well, but 27 to say 40, 1940 some. And uh, I know that the, uh, we would have a, a guest minister come out from Independence on occasion, usually about once a month in later years. And occasionally we'd have a guest singer. Oh. Francis, do you remember the one sort of amply uh, endowed lady from Independence who was singing in the Lost Winter Mountain? No. Oh, really? I don't remember she that. She was singing very high, and uh, <laughs> no, and the wasps, there were wasps in the church, uh, because nobody cleaned them out. Oh. And put in her mouth, and she screamed and <laughs> lurched over the railing and ran out the back door. <laughs> and that broke up that whole that's a, Sunday. That's I remember that. that. <laughs> and uh, living across the way, we had to have the keys to the church. And uh, my mother was the altar lady for years, and. So I had to shine the candlesticks and, and help us help set the altar. Uh -huh. And we always had one basket where we kept all, you know, all everything in. Uh -huh. And there was no heat in the church, and so we couldn't leave water here. And uh, so you couldn't put the flowers on the night before, and you couldn't, uh, of course, put the communion water mm -hmm. wine and wafers out. So we had to do that early in the morning. And uh, in the old church, of course, we, the, the heat was in the basement with a coal furnace. Remember Theodore? Yes. A Theodore. black man would come and build the fire, hopefully at about six in the morning, and <laughs> if the fire lit and, and uh, it was pretty warm, and if it didn't light very well, then we all wore coats. <laughs> and uh, then there was a register right <clears throat> in the um, chancel there, and we'd all sit down in front because it was much warmer in front than it was in the back. All of us, I say, all 12, 10 or 12. 10 or 12. Uh, it was a fairly small gathering. Yeah, very small. You did and, uh, you know, the, the nicest thing is when we got the holes in the windows fixed, then it was warmer. And uh, <laughs> then uh, the, most of the windows here have been, you know, restored because mm -hmm. a lot of them were broken. And, uh, well, we might want to take, take a closer look at a couple of those in, right. in a moment, too. Uh, so it was pretty, it was a small group, and uh, when, you did, when you didn't have services, uh, and people might go to other churches, like for instance at Christmas Eve, would there be a special effort to get a man in to do the no, service? No, no. I remember my mother and father used to go to the, you know, the Roman church for Christmas Eve. Is that right? And I went to the um, Methodist Sunday School all week. We had no Sunday School. And uh, then once in a while we'd go into um, St. Paul's. Mm -hmm. or St. Mary's in Kansas City. Uh, oh, we, we used to go to Independence. Mm -hmm. Of course, Margaret uh -huh. Truman would sing in the choir there. Oh, that was always very good. interesting. I, yeah. I remember being baptized at Independence. Did you? Is that right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Trinity Church there? The Trinity Church. Church. Oh, yeah. I was too old to be baptized, but I'm a bad <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Well, if some there must have been a handful of people who really kept things going then. Yes. I mean, the treasure, did the treasurer work? Well, Mrs. Browning, Mrs. Pauline Browning, Browning was treasurer then. And of course, Dr. Bell's mother and grandmother, Mrs. Fry, uh -huh. and then this Mr. Campbell that... Uh, you were telling me about uh -huh. And uh, I was trying to think of some of the others. Mr. Campbell was really the senior warden yes. for years. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And then Mr. Sankey was quite Mr. Sankey, Mrs. Uh -huh. Sankey. Uh -huh. And uh, Janet Van Vandenberg was from down at uh, Greenland. Mm -hmm. And uh, then early, really, and I was thinking of the people who came in the church, the Phelpses moved here, in addition to the church, and the Johnsons came. John Payne's aunts, Catherine yes. Payne and Francis uh -huh. Petty. 
Mm. Well, you could count the people on the fingers and toes. Would you ever get together any other time besides in church? Was there any kind of social life among the Episcopalians? Well, the women had a guild. The women had a guild. Oh, okay. Men didn't meet. Men didn't. The women, would this be strictly for uh, to visit, or would, did they have projects? What well, sort of things did they do? Uh, of course, they kept the church clean. They clean it real well for Easter and Christmas, and then uh, they'd have bazaars, money making, but mm -hmm. uh, they most of them felt like they could contribute money instead of time. Well, you know, because a, we didn't have a building to uh, meet in or work. So you'd meet in homes? Probably. Yes. Ah. But that was interesting. So there was a women's guild that continued. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's... Uh, well, then, sometime, now you say about, you know, up to about the 40s, things were very infrequent as far as the services, but then things began to pick up. Uh, did they? Did a regular priest finally arrive? That was able to stay. Uh, Father Bakayley uh, and Mrs. Bakayley uh, arrived. He was a retired minister from Connecticut, wasn't he? Someplace. Someplace in the east. Mm -hmm. Yes, and he was a, a really saintly man, a marvelous man. And his wife played the organ, which gave us music. Mm -hmm. Certainly added dignity and interest that we hadn't had. Yeah, that does. And. Uh, the church really started growing with them. They called on people, and they, I think, talked to lady, ladies guild into mm -hmm. more calling. Lady well, calling. and that's when they started the building fund. We mm -hmm. started getting For growing, children. growing veins in. So yes. we could have a Sunday school. Uh -huh. We had a Sunday uh, school. And, uh, then after they uh, left, did you say uh, Don Becker? Yes. yes. For a, a year or so. Father Becker. And then, that, now that's getting up. Asked, was this well, after you came about, back from the... Uh, from my memory for dates. That's around 1950, I believe. I believe so. Uh -huh. And then okay. Elton Smith. And, and that's Jill. when we became a, a yeah. parish. Okay. We were a mission before that. 